Yes, we can jump into the executive officer statement. Okay. So we wanted to share um, some great news. Uh, we would obviously recently notify that there was a general obligation bond sale that the Treasurer conducted, and there was $1.34 billion that was uh, presented and sold. Part of the funds that was um, sold related to refunding issues or bonds, but this program actually received $619.5 million. When, and that's great news. We're excited about that opportunity moving forward. Now what staff is in the position of doing is obviously analyzing um, the certification funding round that we just closed in February, looking at that project list, matching up that project list with the funds we received, and obviously priority, prioritizing that, uh, the funding apportionments and bringing that to the board as soon as possible. Another item we wanted to share, which is uh, something that's been on our, um, the topic for quite some time, is the transfer of the critically overcrowded school bond authority to the new construction program. The deadline to submit the uh, Proposition 55 critically overcrowded school final apportionment applications was April 4th. And staff obviously did receive one application, um, and that has been recorded as $11.7 .7 million in requests for state share of funding. The remaining unconverted projects uh, preliminary apportionment has been automatically rescinded, um, and there is obviously another project in-house that likely will elevate to an appeal. We didn't touch those reservations of funds, respectively, those two projects, as I mentioned. So we are obviously transferring over $145 million uh, from the pot of... COS funds in Proposition 5, 55 and converting that to the new construction pot. So you'll see a contra adjustment movement going on on page 55 in the status of funds. So that will increase the bond authority for new construction up by $145 million. And the other items, the outstanding items, as I mentioned earlier, is we're going to be processing that application in-house and, and obviously dealing with the issue of, of an item that probably will elevate to an appeal. Uh, once those issues have been ironed out um, and whatever uh, resolution we come forward with, uh, they could be potential additional funds move into new construction in the future. The next topic is the upcoming rules procedure subcommittee. Uh, at the March board, the board did uh, direct staff to uh, work on uh, reconvening the meeting, the subcommittee uh, group. And so we have tentatively scheduled on May 30th a, a meeting for the rules subcommittee, and obviously the date and time, or date and loc the date has been secured, but the time and location will be determined, and so we'll be posting that to our website as soon as we um, have that secured. We also convened the audit subcommittee on April 10th, and we will continue discussions in the future and we're also working on reconvening uh, a work group meeting as well. And that information will be made publicly and obviously webcast and noticed in the future. Uh, we wanted to give an update on Aroma San Juan, which was an item that was presented last month, the request for seismic trenching funding. At this point in time, um, staff is exploring issues on how we can try to resolve the, the funding mechanism uh, for these geological faults. And so we're continuing to research this issue, and obviously we'll be bringing something forward in June. And there was a few other items uh, as far as Compton Unified Appeal Request update. Uh, we did receive quite a lengthy uh, opinion or uh, legal analysis from the district, and respectfully, we did put in a request for the Attorney General's Office to review it. That is still in their queue. So as soon as we have an update, we'll be either updating the board um, mm -hmm. with that progress and either bring in to a resolution or bring in that forward to the board. Uh, Santee Elementary School District uh, fund release update. That issue was a labor compliance uh, issue that was raised at a board a, a few months ago on whether or not they actually made certifications. Uh, they did meet the certifications for the program, and as a result, uh, staff did release the funds on April 13, 2012. And uh, just lastly, the reminder is we are going electronic, as a reminder to the board members. Um, as of July 1st, uh, again, the goal is to transition into an electronic agenda, which we are conveniently using. And so we've been more than happy to uh, have conversations on how to use that and how to navigate through the process. So at this point in time, we've heard back from most of the members, and we have uh, maybe two members outstanding, and we'd be happy to meet with them and so they can become acclimated with the with the use of this tool. So with that, open up to any questions. Okay. So moving on, um, we're not going to take a vote on consent, but we can certainly update the finance.
Yes, we'll do the financials. So tab five is the status of fund release report. Um, this report is basically given a synopsis of what funds that we've dispersed over the last few weeks. Um, we actively have been dispersing the priorities and funding um, since the December apportionments. And so the activity we're reporting for March, it's highlighted on page 52. Trying to wait for my, my device to load as well. So $293.3 million was released for the, for the month, of, month of March. So we actually did disperse um, nearly all of the funds um, for the program in the December priority apportionments. There was five projects, <coughs> and I can direct you to page 54A. Five projects, unfortunately, didn't make the cutoff and submit a fund release request. Those five projects, which relates to $13 million, and that's the red bar, and those projects, although they won't lose their apportionment, they will lose their date and line, and they, they will be placed on the bottom of the unfunded list. We do note that the $2 million that's in blue, that designate that the funds have been released, and that reflects the project of, of that Santee release. So that's $2 million. So if we have any other questions, um, <coughs> I can move forward to tab six, which is our financials on the status of funds, which is basically reconciling the bond authority activity for the month. Page 55. Oh, thank you. Now you can hear me. Uh, any comments from the public on any of the items that we've discussed so far? Moving on, thank you. Hey, page 55 is, um, we've added, just wanted to highlight with the board that we actually added another column. And we normally obviously present the estimated unfunded approvals, which is really significant to the program. Uh, we do have $30.6 million that we're bringing forward this month in estimated unfunded approvals, but we also wanted to highlight a new column that we uh, added to the report. It's a miscellaneous adjustment column, and that reflects some of the activity that relates to positive adjustments going back to the program. Those are rescissions, projects that didn't make it through the program, which we would credit back at the authority, and that would, again, increase the authority. But Sometimes when you have the activity of rescissions or r accounting for the preliminary apportionments going back to the program, that number is quite large, and then that offsets the unfunded approvals. So if you had that married together, you wouldn't be able to see some of the intricate approvals or the accounting transactions going in and out of the program. So for the purposes of, of having ease of seeing what's being unfunded and what's coming back to the program, we created this other column. So. Again, I wanted to highlight $13 million in uh, modernization applications were funded this month, and that represents six projects. $1.2 million in high performance uh, was obviously funded as well. That was converted to, uh, so that related to at least $12 million, excuse me, $14.2 million of unfunded approvals for the month in Proposition uh, 1D. We had $16.4 million of activity in Proposition 55. That represented two projects. And there was no activity in unfunded approvals for Proposition 47. So in total, we have $30.6 million in unfunded approvals. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we were uh, sharing a few minutes ago about the $145 million that was converted um, from new construction to uh, the critically overcrowded schools. Uh, we had $118.2 million that was originally reserved, and you'll see in that miscellaneous adjustment column in the green tab area of Proposition 55. Those preliminary reservations, uh, again, were for uh, projects uh, for the critically overcrowded school pr program. They had five years to convert. The board obviously gave them some extension due to the, 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 the freeze that we had in place. And they plugged those projects back in over the summer, so they had uh, those reservations, 118.2 million, plus they had a 15% reserve on top of that. So that equates to the 145 million that actually is being moved or transferred over. The other adjustments, um, as you see in the column, actually represents some of the rescissions um, activities for the month. And so that positive adjustments to the bond authority um, is also being reflected in, the, in this report. And if there's no other questions, I'll open it up. Ms. Silverman, if, so now that we've transferred the funds, do you have an estimation of when the new construction funds would be um, 
would run out? So we actually, if, I'll glad you brought that up. We actually have um, on page 61. 61 is the summary of all the new construction bond authority we have in play right now. And so if you look at that yellow chart, it may not be yellow, maybe beige in my, <laughs> on my iPad, but technically there's about $228 million in new construction bond authority. This is absent of the seismic amount that's reported there. So if you take out of that 422, the seismic money out of that, out of play, we have about 228 um, in new construction bond authority. We have on our workload list um, projects that, we're, that are currently down the pipeline. So now that we've credited the bond authority, I know we created a month ago or two months ago a, a workload list because we had exhaust our authority. And I know the implementation um, group or committee is, is having discussions about what we go from there, but that workload because we didn't have the authority, will be moved now forward to the processing workload list. So there was about $100 million, I believe, that was currently sitting on that authority workload list that we didn't have the authority for them. So now that will be migrated over to the true workload list and we'll be processing those applications. So we may have somewhere in the area of $65 million after you net those projects in-house to the bond authority and that's the current status of, of where we're at. So technically, that is a moving target. Every day it, it draws down. Um, we just had some more projects walk through the door over the last week or two and that, again, is, is something that we're gonna make tr very transparent about who, who, what's in the pipeline. So in summary, it's 65 million after the transfer and after the, the, the assumption on the workload list becoming truly unfunded approvals at some point. Right. We ha that's how much is available for someone to walk through the door currently. Correct. And do, you, do we do about 30 million a month or is it, is it been varied? Um, so are we looking maybe two, three, four months out? It, c it could be uh, it could be a couple months. I mean, this is just we're still working on the pro pro on the projects that are in the pipeline currently. So if we had to continue to project, I mean, we won't be taking those projects tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, they obviously will still have to go through the process of uh, processing the application. But it it could be if we're doing thirty million a month, it could be over the summer. Thank you. Any comments from the public? Okay. Uh, all th all that remains are, are going to be action items. We do we, we do have a tab ten, which is the report from the department. Right, and I was going to get to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so all that we have remaining is action items. So we can either start with the action items and leave the roll open, or we can go ahead and take the department of Edu uh, department of defense presentation. It's So is the, but do we want to? What is it, so your suggestion, Mr. Hagman, would be to start taking action items and wait for the Department of Defense action later. Uh, I know. That's okay, and I know that's an area that Senator Lowenthal had expressed some interest as well. So, why don't we go ahead and do that? We have our guests. From so the Department if, of Defense. Um, if they could come forward while I um, maybe introduce, introduce the please item. do, yes. Is that, um, as, as I indicated at the last board meeting, there is the Department of Defense School Facilities Program, and th I have been acting as the state liaison um, for that program. There are seven projects in California um, that potentially qualify, and it represents about a $160 million investment in base schools um, by the Department of Defense um, and Congress. Uh, I've asked uh, our- Ms. Moore, one second. Mr. Savage, would you mind relinquishing your seat to our guest for now? Since this is their presentation, it'll probably be best if they're at the table. <laughs> Anybody else from, okay, thank you. Thank you, that way we get to see you and hear you well, so thank you, thank you, Bill. 
And I would just like to introduce Lisa Constancio from my office who works on the federal issues and then Patrick O'Brien who is the director of the Department of Defense Office of Economic Adjustment and the overall fiscal administrator of this program to advise the board concerning the program and um, some, of, some of its attributes. So I'll ask Lisa to go first and then Mr. O'Brien. Uh, yesterday morning, State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlakson, hosted a very successful meeting at the California Department of Education. Um, the meeting included all the school districts that are involved, the Department of Defense, and representatives from the California State Agencies that are responsible for school planning and construction in the state. So we had representatives from the Department of Ed, from the Office of Public School Construction, and also from the State Architect. The objective of the meeting was to introduce their respective parties to each other, also to have the Department of Defense talk about their processes, and we also had presentations from each of the school districts about their specific projects. Finally, one of the objectives was to determine if there was any state funding that may be available for the match for these projects. So at this time, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Patrick O'Brien from the Department of Defense. He's gonna talk about basically the methodology of the, of the assessment, He'll go into the details about the program a little bit more and also talk about the appropriations. Uh, Chair Re Member Reyes and members of the Allocation Board, uh, my name is Patrick O'Brien. I'm here representing the Department of Defense. And in that capacity, I direct the Office of Economic Adjustment. A little over a year ago this time, uh, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates visited Fort Riley, Kansas. And as you know, we're involved in a number of uh, conflicts internationally, and uh, our troops and their families are under a lot of pressure. In the course of that visit, he held a town hall with the spouses of our war fighters. And in the course of that town hall, one very uh, dominant theme emerged, and that was, uh, can you do something about the schools on our military base? And uh, a number of people started scratching their heads, well, those are DOD schools. No, they're not DOD schools. And so Mr. Gates came back to the Pentagon and it caused a number of people to start looking at this. And it turns out that we have about 160 schools on our military installations that are operated and maintained by the local sc civilian school districts and it prompted the department to go out and conduct a facility survey to look at condition and capacity needs at these 160 schools across the country. In the course of looking at those schools, the department ranked the schools from worst to best in terms of condition and capacity. At the same time the department was doing this, Congress was starting to take an interest in this and in the FY11 Defense Appropriation Act, $250 million was appropriated for the department to repair, rehab, or replace schools on these military installations to improve the, the situation for our warfighters and the civilian students that attend these schools. Uh, in the course of developing that program, <coughs> Uh, the department came up with some criteria that uh, we would apply across the country. And I want to emphasize a couple of those criteria. One is that this is, this is federal money. It's the first time the federal government was intervening in what is typically a state and local uh, issue for at least 30 plus years. And it was deemed to be enough of a serious situation that they felt federal money was necessary. In applying that federal money, however, the department was concerned that we not supplant what otherwise would be invested in these facilities. So in the execution of that money, uh, it was determined that we need to make sure that we are not supplanting what otherwise would be available for these schools. And that would be available from the predominant sources locally and at the state level. Additionally, uh, it was determined that there should be some type of a local match. And we engaged, I think, in the same type of a deliberative uh, issue or, or process that you would do here. Uh, what is an appropriate share for these local schools districts to be investing in these facilities? We considered a 50% match requirement 
we felt that that was too great considering the, the fiscal constraints that a number of these school districts find themselves in, so we settled on a 20% match requirement. So in essence, we, we, as a result of the FY11 Defense Appropriation Act, we had a $250 million grant program that would provide 80% of the local cost to repair or replace these schools. Uh, Congress, looking at that program, uh, liked it and appropriated an additional $250 million to the department in FY12. And today we have a $500 million program that is designed to pay roughly 80% of each dollar as necessary to bring these schools away from the deficiencies that got them on this list. Why am I here today to talk to you? Well, a couple of reasons. Uh, the list that we came up with uh, has seven California schools and the top two dozen uh, schools that need to be repaired, replaced, or modified. And in looking at those seven schools, they represent roughly a little over $200 million in total costs. And we've been working with each of these school districts, and I want to emphasize this, we did not take the total number of schools and divide them by the 500 million, say each one gets a, a certain share. This is a much more holistic and uh, community-centered approach. We actually <coughs> went to each local school. We talked to the school district. We asked them what would it take to improve this facility to get it off the list. So we have, for each of the two dozen top schools, now a working budget. And based on that budget, we have what we think is a working estimate of a share. And I, I would want to emphasize the reason why I'm here today is uh, we have a state evaluation team uh, that goes out and looks at these proposals. It's comprised of the Department of Education in Washington, my office, uh, the Department of Defense has a few other offices. And what we have done is we have gone out and at each installation we've invited the state to work with the local installation, to work with the local school district and come up with a responsive program. Uh, in doing so, we have also taken a look at the ability to pay that local match requirement. And in looking at the ability to pay the local match requirement, we have found a, a number of school districts in California that cannot come up with that 20% local match. And uh, this is my second visit to Sacramento. Uh, we met with the first dozen schools back in October, did a lot of work with them, and so we found that a couple of the uh, schools can be addressed through the local school district coming up with the match, but there are some that cannot. Um, we convened a second meeting back in Washington for the second dozen schools <coughs> earlier this spring. And on the basis of that meeting, we, we found that there are uh, additional school districts that cannot come up with the match. And uh, it's going to make our job more difficult to provide those type of funds to improve these schools. So as a result of that, we believe there's anywhere from uh, 23 to $25 million that local schools in California could benefit from in terms of matching our 80% money in this program. And I, I want to emphasize a couple other things. This program is, is uh, for the record, is uh, presented in the Federal Register on September 9th, 2011. Um, it is referenced also a list that the department developed. It's a list that uh, ranks these schools from worst to best. Uh, it is very much in the public record now what schools are on that list. And uh, what we're trying to do, quite frankly, is to enable uh, these school districts <coughs> with the benefit of their states and the military installations to improve them. And um, I would like to just uh, express our appreciation. Um, we typically work with base closures. We typically work with growth expansions, et cetera, on these military bases. Uh, this was an emergent requirement that came about because the secretary had this town hall and uh, Congress sat up uh, this was not a vote that went along party lines. It was a unanimous vote that this should be done for uh, the kids, the war fighters. Uh, when we went out, we did not uh, try to pick and choose who was best or worst. We started at the top of the list and we're working ourselves down this list. So I come to you today to invite your participation and your help, if you can, 
so that we can try to help some of the schools in california be more responsive to the needs that these kids are finding as they go to them thank you thank you do you seem to have a spreadsheet in front of you is there a chance that the boards can receive a copy of that at some point uh, Ms. Silverman, if you could make those arrangements. It should be in your information it's in, package. Oh. It's in the item. I missed um, that it's, entirely. It's I focused on the action items. It's attached. Okay, D. thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Uh, before we go any further, can we please establish quorum? Yes, Senator Lowenthal. Here. Senator Hancock. Senator Wyland. Assemblymember Brownlee. Assemblymember Buchanan, Assemblymember Hagman, Here. Esteban Almanza, Here. Kathleen Moore, Here. Pedro Reyes, present. We have a quorum. Thank you. Let me let me see if I understand and what what as I understand now what our issues are. The Department of Defense looked at their military base schools they have identified from those most in need of repair to those least in need or ha having the, the least number and that seven schools military based schools in california have been identified as being in critical need of repair or replacement they're on the highest list of 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 schools department of defense will contribute 80 percent of the cost some of the districts of these seven schools three can, but there is at least three or four schools or four that can't come up with a match. The first thing is it'd be interesting for us to look at um, what you used as your facility condition, facility condition index that was used to, to, to assess the facilities to see why you came up with you know the, these schools so we can understand more what's going on uh, and uh, we may need to l understand that and maybe it's, it's something that we could benefit by actually looking at this when we deal with modernization because obviously there is something going on there's a disconnect between your assessment and our assessment especially in the modernization when in fact some of these schools who cannot come up with a match, and some that can, have already used up their eligibility because we have recently modernized them. And so they are now been modernized, and yet they're in the worst condition in the nation. And so it does tell us that there is a disconnect somewhere there, most likely that when modernization money is used, it's used just to deal with serious deferred maintenance, and it really doesn't get at the critical issues. It keeps the lights on, it keeps the electricity from having an electrical fire maybe, but it, it doesn't really deal with some of these issues. So uh, we, we, we really have to come to grips with that. The issue is, to me, is that uh, what we can do, uh, <coughs> especially in those that cannot come up with a match, and we need to identify who is eligible that we could help out also, <coughs> either through hardship or, but uh, the question is if, if in fact some of these are not eligible because they've used up their eligibility, we uh, now have our US veterans coming back to California, going to some of the worst schools in the nation. The federal government will put up 80% of the money to modernize. They can't come up with anything. What can we do about that is the issue. Can OPS, can we deal with this? Where are we? This is an opportunity without state funds to really, or much to, to deal with. Hopefully the districts can come up with a match, but if they can't, and if we've modernized them, yet they're still in horrendous condition, is there anything with the federal government coming up wh when we have, and this issue is gonna, you know, when you think about it, with all those returning veterans coming back from Afghanistan and Iran uh, and, and Iraq, uh, hopefully not Iran, but Iraq, who knows? Nuclear weapons, with the development of nuclear weapons out there, maybe there too, hopefully not. Hopefully that our, our uh, 
our embargo and our, and our ability to, to stop the, the development, it will not be Iran. But, but it's a hotbed, and we know that we've lost many soldiers, and it's been difficult enough for soldiers having to do two and three uh, trips there. Uh, so I, I'm just really concerned about what are we going to do. It's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. I don't want to lose this opportunity. It's critically important. What, what, what options do we have? And I'd love to hear from OPSC and to hear from other members. You know, what, what can we do? Mr. Gannon, Mr. Hagman, after. I apologize. I had to be here sooner, and I wasn't here at the beginning of this presentation. Mm -hmm. But I'm mm -hmm. trying to understand why, if in the last 12 years they've gotten the modernization money from the state, which they had to have a match, what happened to it? I, I, and because it seems to me that you would be able to use your 80 percent from the federal government as your match for the state part and probably do a better job of modernization than you could right. other schools unless the amounts that we calculate them on is inadequate. So maybe um, we could have staff come back to us with a report on these schools and find out what condition they are in. I don't know how. I mean, I, I did it's reflect a little bit on our whole seismic discussions that we had where I, you know, one of the districts and many of the schools highlighted were in my school district where we had actually torn down and replaced the schools. And, you know, they were a few years old and never should have been on the list but weren't taken off the list. So, so maybe um, uh, staff could let us know, you know, I, I'd like to just have some kind of consensus on what the condition is. Mm -hmm. What they, needs to be done? What was done? Um, you know, and and a little bit more information. Because that's why I'd like to also have staff use the Department of Defense's uh, facility condition index. They have an elaborate system in which they look at the condition, and be interesting to see what that says versus the data that we use for modernization. Hold on, though. Would that be a separate request since, I mean, we can go with the Department of Defense condition index on all schools in California, uh, or do you want to just apply it to those in the military base as a side-by-side -side comparison for our own edification? I think that if we start using the Department of Defense uh, index, then are we applying that index to all bonds moving forward? I was, I was th just thinking, uh, be nice since they've used it on these schools for us to just mm -hmm. to see that index. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I like to see it in a on a on a it's more, as, as one vote. Right. I would like to see a compare and contrast of the index, generally speaking, uh, as opposed to as it as it applies to specific schools, uh, so that we understand the difference, the different measuring tools that mm -hmm. they're using. Um, I, I would be concerned that we. Embrace the index without knowing what it is yet. I, 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 I agree. I'm not recommending we okay. embrace the index. Right. I'd just like to know from our staff, you know, okay, they were modernized. What condition are they in? How do they compare to other schools in the district? Theoretically, when you're modernized, you're bringing it all, you're bringing, you know, your electrical, your uh, um, plumbing, your, um, you know, seismic, all, all those things, not seismic, so, but it will seismic, yeah, I mean, structurally, you've got the inspections, your ADA, theoretically, you're, you're bringing schools up to this standard. So if they were modernized in the last 12 years, um, mm -hmm. why aren't they up to this standard? What condition are they in? And what do we need, if we do have to fix them, I, I mean, I, I'd like to, to have But them. Mr. O'Brien is dying to respond, but I have Mr. Hagman and Ms. Moore in the queue. So do we want to go ahead and give a chance to Mr. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I just want to clarify because this, this is a, a, a very important state local issue. I am representing a federal governmental presence and we are looking to partner with a state and local presence. What I want to stress are two things. Don't lose sight of the fact that the evaluation that the department did did not just consider condition but also capacity. Okay, there are, there are several portables at a few of these locations where, you know, the, the existing physical plant is not adequate to, to house the students, and they've been bringing in portables and portables and portables. So this, this, this list, per Congress's direction, took a look at both condition and capacity. Secondly, 
it is attempting to norm everything to a similar standard so we could evaluate everybody across the country california schools compared to kansas schools compared to georgia schools and and consequently uh... we have a standard that was established that led to a ranking in executing these funds we are attempting to work with the local education agency to build to what those local standards are not the federal standard but to to respond and build to what would otherwise be done at the local level so mm -hmm. i think those are important caveats for you to to consider as you look at this okay. mr hagman and Ms. moore thank you mr chair and i i think without do, trying to do too much speculation on this report without actually looking at the schools and matching up apples and apples i mean doing enough with the federal agencies in the past like i have they may have, you know, requirement of so many light bulbs in the, in the room versus so many desks or portables versus structures. It could be something that we're totally okay with in our schools, but they're not with their facilities. But it's not to say it's not a great opportunity to take advantage of 80% leveraged dollars. Right. Um, my question is not so much of the ranking, although I'm curious to see what it's like and to see if we can match it up of our standards. But let's say we can get this 80% dollars for our schools, for these particular schools. Do we need special legislation because we're getting close in timelines or trailer bills, that kind of thing, in order to be able to pull out some of this money? Does it have to be a general fund? Can we pull out the bond? Those kind of mechanics to come up with a 20% match for these schools <laughs> are more of, I think, getting <coughs> back with the analysis of their list and, and they're comparing apples and oranges. And then where do we come up with the 20% matching? What funds can we apply to that? What do we knew, need to do, if any, as a legislature to expedite that, assuming that's what the direction of the board wants to do. I don't see why we wouldn't. It's a great opportunity for us. Um, so that's, I guess, the next phase two of the report. But I'm excited at the fact that the federal government stepped up. Appreciate that they're um, taking care of in the way they can our troops coming back. And I think we should partner up with them the best way we can to see how we can make the story go forward. Ms. Moore and then Mr. Almanza. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, what's the government's timeline on the award and spend of this money? Uh, the expectation is that we're uh, attempting to obligate these funds as quickly as possible to have projects built. So the first uh, appropriation of $250 million, which occurred uh, last April, basically, uh, we worked over last summer to develop the program construct. We invited a top dozen schools to Washington in October. They spent the winter basically developing proposals, and we anticipate it starting to announce awards off the first $250 million uh, within the next two to three weeks. Um, the important thing about the, the 250 and 250, uh, before we can go to school two or three on the list, we've, we have to size the amount for school number one. So we're trying to size the federal share working ourselves down this list so each school above, say, number 20, Four, which is Travis, um, uh, make sure that everyone is adequately taken care of before we get to the next one in line. So we're attempting to size these post haste uh, because we're worried that as the money is available today, um, as you have your dynamic fiscal situation here in the state, we have a dynamic fiscal situation at the national level. We want to try to get this behind those schools as quickly as possible. So. How much time does California have to get their application? Well, let me tell you, we're working very, uh, and I want to address one item here. Um, the school districts had an opportunity to respond to the federal evaluation to make sure wh that what we were considering in the federal evaluation accurately reflected what was going on locally. And once these schools were on the list, we actually started working with them on an individualized basis, and we've actually visited mis many, if not most of them. Uh, I don't think you'll find that the school district is in disagreement with what the, the findings are. So we're actually working with them now on the design and uh, costing of the construction or the rehab at this time. So we're actually sizing the projects as I speak to you today. And, uh, you know, it's our hope actually to obligate uh, all that first 250 million, working ourselves down through the first uh, 250 million. Um, probably before the end of this federal fiscal year and to start uh, going into the next 250 million, working ourselves down through the second dozen um, in, with the start of FY13. September? <laughs> so we're talking September? Or, or 
we're, we're really trying to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, you know. So is there any way to assign someone in our staff to work with this operation, the schools on the list, come back to agreement what the cost is, and we have to start taking a how, which vehicle, if we agree to do this, which I assume we're all in agreement here, can we take it out existing bonds about, was there a whole bunch of people unhappy here or waiting in line for money, or do we have to go back to legislation and do a general fund or someplace else? I don't know what you do. So, Senator Lowenthal. Yeah, maybe you could explain also, you said that, you know, some of the school districts, I think there are three of the seven schools can actually do the match, you know. The four, I think there's four that cannot do the match. And you did mention that the federal government might be in a position also to help in some cases when school districts can't do the match. Can you explain that a little bit and where we are? If we are limited in terms of, because we've used up our own eligibility mm -hmm. and they can't do the match and without legislation we can't provide the match, what can, how can we work together on that? Sure, um, as I said, there are seven California schools in the top two dozen. Uh, of those seven schools, uh, school districts are representing three of those schools. Uh, San Diego has one, and uh, the folks at China Lake have two. Uh, those two school districts are evidencing to us an ability to cover the match requirement. Uh, we have, uh, on the other hand, schools at Edwards Air Force Base, Camp Pendleton, and Travis Air Force Base, um, and three installations but four schools. One at, one at Edwards, uh, there are two schools that were combined at Edwards into one. We have two schools at Camp Pendleton, and we have one school at Travis. Um, those school districts, by nature of what they are and how they are situated, have a very difficult time uh, generating any kind of a uh, of a bond issue or any other type of an opportunity to do so. In fact, one of the school districts covers a 500 square mile area, which is not unheard of given some of the the dynamics that we find under military installations. Um, so we do have some flexibility to uh, to look at the local match, and and uh, in certain instances to waive a portion of that local match. Um, the situation, though, that we're finding with all the schools here, and, and um, I'll just say, as I mentioned, we have underwritten projects at uh, the majority of the first dozen, and we're well into the second dozen now. Uh, we're not really looking at a waiver except for uh, the California schools at this time and possibly one other location. And uh, the, the preponderance of the need in California is such that we can have some flexibility. Uh, but I'll just tell you, you know, candidly speaking, we're working with school districts representing all these areas. A couple of these school districts um, are just ill-equipped to handle the fiscal responsibility of capital improvements on these sites. And it's putting the kids at a very difficult situation um, and and uh, our understanding is, okay, let's have the federal government step up with 80% and see what else we can get out of the other state and local interest on these properties. And so we're willing to sit down and work with them on a case-by-case -case basis, but as I said, some of these situations, you know, if you have four or five schools that cover a 500-mile radius and the population is barely there to support a, uh, a bond, let alone something else, it, you're not going to get anything out of that local school district. Mr. Kenner. Yeah. I, I almost feel like we're talking in code here. <laughs> I mean, I, what I'd like to know is we know what the districts are, what's been done or is being done, um, how much, you know, what improvements are needed, how much is it going to cost, what is the federal government willing to contribute on that, and what would be the state's obligation? Because right now, you know, you've identified districts, but I don't know those numbers. I don't know if those numbers mean that half the buildings need to be modernized, a third of them. If it means, as you were talking about, with portables, you need to replace a dozen portables with permanent construction. It's a different. If it's, it's a different situation at each site. I'm sure. So, is there any way? So I think it'd be good to, to us on I, all of that, so we can actually I, make some. Why don't, why don't I think I that's what we were going. I think that where I was going to go, if I may, is basically direct staff to work to identify what the 
recognized needs are or what is being presented as the needs for purposes of qualifying for these. I mean, when we look at, at 500 million to 20%, or if this is 80 million, 80%, you're looking at an additional 125 million. No, that's total. That'd be total. Uh, we, we, That'd expect, be total. we expect right. out of a $500 million program, California accounts for about 200 million of that. So 40, and, and of that 40 million, as I said, we have three schools where we think we can have some kind of a match that we can work with, and, and we really feel the, the need is between 23 and 25 million on this portfolio. All right, so, so I think we need information. We need if the staff could work with you, if, and board members, please jump in, uh, to identify the, what I would be good to go to know is what you were talking about earlier in terms of what we've spent on eligibility already. You talked about the portables. We have funded many of those portables as an action item. Uh, so the fact that they have portables, they may not, we may not be viewing it as the same issue as you have. So it will be good to know that what we're talking about and to identify that we're, you know, if you put them in your top two dozen, would we put them in our top two dozen as well statewide? If I, we if are. I may. Absolutely. Just, yeah, and, and so I think it would be important to know on those districts, what are we talking about dollars and what are we talking about in terms of the projects? But go ahead, Ms. Moore. Well, as, as I brought this item forward to the board and as I have been functioning as the liaison um, in this kind of unique situation with the federal government and the Department of Defense and the local school districts, um, I have reviewed the information that, that they have and um, I'll offer these two things. One, the U.S. Department of Education, when it, um, Department of Defense um, went about this in a very different manner than we and the state of California go about modernization. So you will be comparing apples to oranges. Um, the, the issue for the Department of Defense is they went out to the sites, they looked at systems, and they looked at capacity. So for instance, if the electrical system is in need of replacement, they quantified that and put it into the report and established a dollar value of it. If there were um, you know, 25 <coughs> portables on the site and the multipurpose room was built for a school that didn't have 25 portables, they quantified the need to expand the multipurpose room to be able to serve that to serve a greater population, and they put that into an estimated cost. Um, they also had an educational specification that they did their index um, against. And so, for instance, if they were missing a, a library or some important facility on the campus, they quantified that and also put it into the cost. So they established, <coughs> through this assessment that was done by a third-party independent, if I'm correct, um, they established each of the schools what was needed at the school. We in California actually do it differently. We say, if you are eligible, we will provide you with X amount of dollars for, your, uh, for the students that are attending that school, and we establish a total dollar value, and we give that funding to the school district. You say, match it 40% and do your project. Do whatever you can with your project, and do, do what you determine you should do. So I think where the difference is, is that the federal government looked at the projects and said, this is what this school needs to come back up to base zero. Um, so that going forward in the future, you simply need to maintain this facility and maybe 20 years from now, you need to do capital renewals again. In some cases for the federal government, they are demolishing the school and, and building anew. They have determined that with the local authorities that it is a better investment of the dollars to actually tear down what exists and build a new school. We have a program similar to that um, in, in our facility hardship program where we say if you have 50% of, if it's cost more than 50% of the project, we'll look at the de demolition. Am I being correct in, in, in That's that, correct. In, if in there's that an piece. imminent health and safety so there's issue. Some perhaps apples to apples, but it's mainly apples to oranges. So you're ne we don't sit, we at the state never rank anybody, and we at the state never tell a district actually what to do with the dollars that we provide to them. We don't rank the issues at their site and say, you must fix X first or not. That we leave as a local decision. So I think what, what 
is probably a bet, and, we, and they certainly, it's all public information, all that can be shared with the board and probably should be because it's a very different approach than what we do in what we have done in California around our modernization and rehabilitation of fields facilities. But if you're looking for uh, how to compare those two, you're not going to be able to. Very different approaches. But what you, what I think is the opportunity here in California is that, you know, the, the federal government is willing to put 80% into projects that, that we, you know, could match 20% in, for a few cases and have some really um, amazing things happen for these, for these districts um, that serve our military students. So, uh, and I think the question to be asked, and it's, it's the, the easy question is, we already know, it's not easily done. They're not ready to go with modernization so that they can get their match and they could use that in, into, this, into this fund. They're not at that place because they just started with these projects. Our program is you don't get your money till the end of the program. Their program is they scope it, then they establish the budget, and then they go, to, they go with their program. Ours, we give them the money at the end, they, they give it at the beginning. So our opportunity is, is there any possibility of some type of um, special consideration for this? Um, because I don't think it fits into the normal box of how we do business here in California. Mr. Hagman, then Ms. Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I see three different issues. One, we got to understand that and match what their needs are with our funds. Two, we need to set a basically expedited process in order for us to let other schools down the, the list and make it happen. And um, kind of do the will plus the mechanics of what would happen if we were to do this. The suggestion, this is all debated out here, is again another special subcommittee, but one that can really expedite the process, work hand in hand with staff, you know, delays on Ms. Moore's leap years ahead of all of us, but it'll definitely be on it, but at some point come back as quickly as we can with a recommendation looking at where the funding can possibly come from, if it's possible. Does it even qualify for our bond fundings, and if so, in what ways? We don't know the legalities of it. If it's legal, what's the mechanics would be? Because there's always going to be winners and losers on the list to do that. And then also, when that we could fund these type of projects with the different funds that we have. So there's, a, there's at least those three barriers that I see that we really need to grind into with staff to figure out what's needed and then come back to the full board and say, we could do it, this is the way we could do it, or we can't, but this is what we're missing, this is what we need to make it happen. But that's my suggestion. That way it'll go quicker, they're still slower, maybe get that going. Ms. Buchanan? Yeah, I, that's fine with me. I, mean, I, I think staff could probably outline those options for me because right now, I don't. I think all of us, if we could take advantage of an 80% or 100% grant from the federal government, all of us want the best facilities possible for, our, for the students in this state. But right now what we know is you've identified some schools. You think it might be as much as $200 million worth of improvements. You know, I don't know what's involved in the projects, what the cost is, where you are working with the schools, whether any of them have architects or in the process of drawing up plans or doing any kind of master plans or if there's other kinds of support we need to give them. You've sort of alluded to the fact that some districts are better with their facility plannings than others. So, you know, if we could just get some more information, I think, I think that's would, a state like comment, a though. decision about this. Um, I, I kind of like the idea of, uh, Mr. Hammond, where you're going with the small committee to kind of work out the issues with staff. I think, uh, Ms. Moore, I think you would like to chair that because you've put a lot of effort into this already. <laughs> uh, and then if um, you folks have interest, Senator Lontho, do you have any interest? I don't know. Sure. And I know Mr. Hagman does. I know Ms. Buchanan does. <laughs> and, and, and I know that Esteban does too, so that's the subcommittee. I think we is, all do have an interest. I mean, I think we understand that if there's an opportunity, we yeah. know what the issues are. I think the um, at 200 million, the maximum exposure is going to be 50 million. That would be the 20 percent, 80 percent. He said maximum. 23 million is what. We means. believe it's between 23 and 25. 23 and 25, because okay. Some of them have a match. Already. So we would need to find out, uh, you know, the potential funding sources for this, because I'll be. Blunt and candid with you. General fund is pretty much out of the question. Really? I mean, but you know, I just, I uh, just come in, you know, wearing the finance hat and looking at the May revision budget right now. We're like looking at it and saying, "Wow, 
So, but you know, I, I don't get to vote. I just raising the issue. But uh, if there are other funding sources and some of the eligibility issues and some of the obstacles that are out there right now for the school districts, it'd be good to flush those out and see what what's out there. And we may find that the government, the federal government, can help us even more. We need to understand. But uh, yeah, so, we, so anyway, so is that. So we have Senator Lowenthal, would you like to be in the committee or you go ahead and acquiesce to the other members? I'm okay. I just I can't put more than five in. So at this point, Whatever. I have Ms. Moore, I have Mr. Almanza, and uh, Ms. Buchanan, Mr. Ha Mr. Hagman. I just want to go public if That's you're going to be in. Just let the four. That's fine. The fine. Okay, the four. So there's only four. And they'll work with uh, Mr. Bryan and staff in trying to resolve and trying to see what the options are to bring up to the board. Um, so thank you, sir. Thank you for the. No, we appreciate your consideration of this uh, okay. on all your behalf. Great, thank you. Okay, with that, we go back to our prior. Uh, okay, can we move the minutes? Move the minutes. Move the minutes. There's been moves. There a second. second. Is there, there's been second. Um, uh, one note is we're trying to be a little bit briefer on the minutes. So if anybody has issues with that, let me know. But at this point, that's sort of the direction of staff to try to not bring in and, and point out the, t the color of my tie at the meeting. That'd be helpful. Um, so, all right. So, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Uh, and we'll move the consent calendar. And I think we have, uh, if we could add the additional, Ms. Silverman, we want to add the, uh, the extra. Tab 7, which is East Side, East Side Union Facility Hardship. Is it okay we add that to the consent? Yes, sir. This seems like a repair thing, even though it's a very small amount of money is what they're asking for. I'm not concerned about the money thing, but we're using 30-year bond money to fix the $16,000 beam. Is that part of normal maintenance, or is that part of, would you consider that facility upgrade? On this? I look, Mr. Mireles. In this particular case, because it was um, <coughs> damage to the beams, the, it, it affected the structural integrity of the building. The, depart the Division of State Architect okay did consider this to be a health and safety issue, and that's why they qualified under the facility hardship program. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's been moved and seconded then with the, uh, you, so. with the addition of the, uh, yeah. of the other item. Okay. It's been seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Next item. Is that it for the action items then? Tab eight. Tab eight. Tab nine. Uh, Mr. Chris. Chair, I'll move to tab eight, which is the technical regs. It's been moved. Is there a second? Yes. It's been moved and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Senator Lowenthal, aye. 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 Thank you. We've moved tab nine. I just have one question on that, too, Mr. Yes. Chair. Um, if we do transfer this out, which I'm still confused, the 16.34 million versus the 131 cash on hand, the authority versus cash on hand. Well, that will not trigger anything we w don't want to trigger at this point if we move this money over, right? Okay. Uh, tab 9, we have to have a more a longer conversation, so I'm glad Senator Hancock was able to join us. I just texted Senator Bryan. Health I, well, thank you. Uh, before we get started, is Senator Hancock, are you okay with the minutes, approving the minutes and the consent can item? Can we add you on that? Okay. Do we have everybody on? Is there anything that's still open that needs to be added? Okay, thank you. On tab nine. Um, I think on tab nine, the purpose of the report, it should drop the lease purchase program and should refer to it as a joint facilities. Um, but go ahead, Senator. Well, you know, thank you for um, for keeping this item on the agenda. I guess where we are now is that we continue to wait for a response from the Attorney General on whether the State Allocation Board, and this is a quote from our request to the Attorney General, which is identical to the request that we made to Ledge Council about whether the State Allocation Board can apportion the proceeds of bonds issued pursuant to the Class Size Reduction Kindergarten University Public Education Facilities Bond Act of 1998 
to a, a school district for joint use facilities projects constructed pursuant to the Lee Roy F. Green School Facilities Act of 1998 and approved during a later funding cycle. Um, this was actually done in 2010 uh, when I uh, requested to do something similar. These residual funds can no longer be used um, for the Bond Act of 1998 <coughs> because the, pro the particular lease purchase program is a defunct program. So these are residual funds. These are not funds that could be allocated to their former use. Um, initially, uh, OPSC had asked the question, had said, well, in 2010, when this was done, I gather nobody asked anybody. It was just done, and the funds had been used. When I asked this question last year in July, uh, it was decided that we had to have an AG's opinion prior to doing that. And it took quite a long time to get the AG's opinion. And in the meantime, w my <coughs> office asked Ledge Council. Ledge Council opined that it could be done. Um, however, the question was asked in a different way to the AG's office who opined that it could not be done. This would imply, of course, that both the 2010 actions taken by this board were illegal um, and or that money will sit in uh, this res residual fund forever and not be able to be used for any purpose unless there is, we go back to the voters and get the bond voted on again for use of the original the uh, these residual funds. This seems to be quite cumbersome, expensive, and given the small amount of money, not cost effective. So we ha we have a conundrum. Um, in the interim, OPSC asked the identical question that I had asked Ledge Council to the AG. They asked it, however, as one of three <coughs> questions. And the AG has so far answered two of the questions in the negative. They have not yet asked, answered the question uh, that we asked Ledge Council to clarify. So we are still waiting for an answer from the AG. Um, and I, I just wanted to share with the board my real sadness. It's even more than frustration at this point. And I don't know about the other joint use projects that are in line waiting for funds. I know there are a number of them. But there is a project in Alameda County um, the city of Alameda that represents the best of what joint use projects are meant to be. The Alameda Boys and Girls Club, partnering with Alameda Unified School District, have collaborated to build a facility that is used by the Boys and Girls Club for community and after school activities and used every day by the school district by two schools that are adjacent to the Boys and Girls Club. And um, they actually have a shared property line. And because, although cleared for funding, the Alameda Boys and Girls Club could not get the money they needed to complete the project, they took out a bridge loan, completed the project, which is now being used on our assurances that the money will be coming. And um, because a similar transfer had been done in 2010. And uh, in the meantime, they are now paying uh, $5,000 to $7,000 a month in interest for every month that goes by on this loan that they took out to finish the project, bridge loan. So the longer it takes 
our state government to come forward and help them by, make, by giving them the money to pay off the bridge loan. The longer this uh, little nonprofit organization spends money that could be used for other purposes, for the school district, for, um, for the schools, and the more, honestly, I, what I feel so bad about is I, I just feel that it makes state government look bad that we're not able to help in a timely way. I, 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 I guess, um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if we just continue so, well, this item waiting and hoping for an AG opinion, but I think we have a larger issue, which is in future school bonds, if there are any, um, or uh, what do we do about the fact that there's about $12 million sitting in this fund that apparently cannot be, un unless we have the AG give us an opinion, cannot be used as they have been in the past to uh, fund other bond projects? Uh, but before, I think there's a couple clarifications I'd like to pursue. Uh, one is... Let the record show that this chair was not here back in 2010. No, I'm kidding. Um, neither, neither was I. The, uh, I want to make sure we're talking about the right amount with the right pot of money, though, because when I look at, and I'm looking at page 56 in our book. In um, this book? In either your iPad or the, uh, it's, uh, I'm looking, uh, I'm looking at tab. Tab six. Tab six. Oh, tab, six. tab six in your iPad or in the book, in the hard book. And it's my understanding from having conversations with your staff that we're talking about the blue box on the top, which that only has 4.5 million, not 12 million. Okay. So are we talking four and a half million, or are we talking 12 million? Um, we're talking the four and a half million. Okay. So it's four and a half million. When you s for the ledge council opinion. Okay. Right. And so then the question is, when assurances were made to this group that funding would be provided, assurances were made by whom, since the board had not quite taken an action yet? Pardon? I'm sorry. When assurances were made to this group that the money was forthcoming and they went and did this financing where they're paying five to 7,000 a month in interest, assurances were made by whom that, because my understanding is the board had not taken an action yet. Um, no, I think that's right. The, the um, district was actually offered a choice. They could take less money, and then they'd have to pay it all out of their own pocket, which would have finished the joint use account. Or they could wait until we got this resolved, in which case they would be first in line for the money, and there were four or five other projects that could also, not in Alameda County, actually down south, that could be that could be funded as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they chose to. Um, they chose. Right. So because the six hundred thousand would be available to them would have been under the modernization. Is that correct, staff? Am I looking at the right table? It's actually it's about six hundred thousand. The career, or excuse me, the joint use program right. Proposition One D. It's available, and there was okay. obviously uh, twelve projects. Excuse me, $12 million in projects in oh, line. Oh, I'm sorry. That's where the 600 comes in. The other on page 55. Correct. So I guess the reason why I like to keep this item for discussion is I know we're waiting for the AG's opinion as to whether or not this can be done because that's what the treasurer has requested of us, that they're in the opinion that it cannot be done because of the covenants in the bond. My layman's understanding of the issue, and I apologize if I butcher things up. And so we're waiting for that, that opinion to, to give us the green light. But I think more fundamental than that, as we wait for that, I think this board has to take an affirmative action to, in fact, transfer those funds. If, if the AG says, yes, we can do it, then we as a board also have to vote to do it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that while everybody seems supportive of you getting the AG's opinion, we have, frankly have never taken up the issue for a vote. And so I wanted to leave it uh, here for a conversation so the board members can express whether or not this is something that they want to support. 
because at this point we're beating up the AG to get this and we can get to the treasurers. And if the votes are on there to provide this, then it's probably good to know that as well, I think. Well, if you're asking, uh, the Department of Education strongly supports joint use and would strongly support moving forward with um, securing the opinion and having the item come back before us for um, possible consideration to fund down the list of joint use projects that exist. So okay. I'm strongly in support of it. Okay. Just want to, Ms. Buchanan. What do we have in outstanding joint use projects where we where they've actually? Uh, we actually have. Um, about a year and a half ago when we were going through this discussion, um, there were a number of projects that came in in the joint use filing round in, in I believe in March 2010. And there were, like I said, several projects at various stages. Uh, the top few projects represent Redondo Beach and then Alameda Boys and Girls Club. So that was a challenge, was hoping to get the authorization to move the cash in the, and potentially the authority, decreed authority for the joint use program because at that point in time, we presented options on whether or not any project on that list, the top of the list first, wanted to take what we call a haircut, a reduced project, because that's right. we're only limited in the 600,000 authority. So these projects haven't been presented for any unfunded approvals at this point in time. And I don't remember, because I remember, we, mm -hmm. Senator, we talked about this. So yeah. of the projects, how many are either have, are in construction? I mean, how many? Of the joint use, do we have anything being can can be rescinded at some point in the future? Yeah, that's what I'm saying of, is yeah. if, if a project hasn't started, I mean, I think clearly the projects that are in construction, I would say let's fund those. The remainder, given where we are with new construction, I would I would necessarily say allocate the whole twenty one million to joint use, but I would say of those projects that are, you know, like the Alameda, mm -hmm. let's fund those. I would I would suggest that we consider putting the rest into new construction because we know that's going to be in demand. It's only 4.5 million in question. Uh, and then, um, you know, after that, we're going to have to determine where we go with a project list or unfunded list or whatever we're going to do. But I, I, I don't. I wouldn't be encouraging someone to go out there now. I would. I would take right. care of those projects right. that are in right. line and right. transfer the rest into new construction. Mr. Hagman. Well, there's two different issues for me too. It's like. When this has been a couple years now since this list has been reviewed and kind of organized, like area of the other funding stream, if we did have money in there, then I think you would start there and start the process over again. But secondly, I'm with the senator. Is why can't we get a response out of our attorney general's office? And is there any way we can maybe invite them for our next meeting to explain why they're not performing their duties and giving us a response? Because I think there's some issues there that. It's a little frustrating on our side that we need to move forward and we need to have direction. And if they're supposed to be giving us legal counsel on our issue and uh, opinion on this, I'd like to see that as well before we make any other decision. Mr. Chair, my other question is, can, can we get it with the two-thirds vote of the legislature if, if we don't have authority as a board? That's the issue that, it's, as I understand, and I'll go to Henry next, as I understand it, it's a bond covenant issue. And that's why so Senator Hancock pointed out that in order to, uh, in the AG's write-up at this point, is that we would have to put this before the voters again to essentially amend the initiative. I think folks would look at this and, and question the authority that this board had back in 2010 and actually transfer those funds. And that's all I want to say about that issue. To Henry. To transform for them to, to, a more to joint use or to jo transfer them to the same use? To I joint think. use. It, the bill, the AB 127, speaks to transferring a specified amount or is up to a specified amount to the joint use. And so some would argue that what the voters voted on was to transfer that amount and did not leave it open. The Ledge Council's opinion says, yes, it's open. It was just an amount to be transferred. It doesn't preclude anything else. The AG's opinion at this point, as I understand it, is saying because the amount was specified, it hindered you from transferring additional resources. But Henry, why don't you take this legal side of the issue? Yeah. That, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, that's that's correct. And and I do need to make a comment here in fairness to the Attorney General's office. Um, due to the large number of issues this board has, at one time, um, a high watermark was we had six opinions pending, opinion requests pending, uh, informal opinion requests pending from the AG's office. We still currently have um, four opinion requests pending. Uh, with regards to this one, um, Senator, Lo uh, Senator Hancock, we have been 
uh, stressing to the AG's office that this was a high priority, that it was a matter of um, urgency to the board. Uh, they had it as a priority. I actually have been calling them probably at least once a week, if not several times a week, to check on status and kind of keep them working on it. Originally, we were advised that they were planning to combine the opinion that they gave us with uh, a specific opinion regarding the Ledge Council opinion. Apparently, um, I don't know if a, a, the, somebody's minds were changed or what have you, but uh, in our last conversation with them, we've been told that that's going to be coming as a separate opinion, and it's the next one in the queue, so they are going to be working on it. I asked them if they would be able to have that by this meeting. Um, they told me that they're, because of their press of business, they would not be able to, but they would make it a priority. Yeah, it should be. Mr. Yeah. Almanza? Now, as I understand it, uh, the only reason we're asking for an AG opinion is because the state treasurer told us they would not transfer the funds unless the AG said he could. That's correct. Okay. Good job. So, Mr. Senator, Chair, that's like the need to turn on to the next problem. meeting, maybe get our <laughs> opinion at least. I, I guess part of the reason why I wanted to leave it on is so we could we could have the conversation and Senator Hancock get a sense of whether or not this is an issue that the board currently supports. I, if if the board was not going to be supportive of this transfer, Hancock, come he, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, Senator, go ahead. This is so technical. You almost have to be a lawyer. I, I have to apologize. I'd like my staff member to come here. She has just told me, and she's playing telephone for me to join mm -hmm. you when we go around, that um, we're talking about different pots. The ledge council um, opinion relates to the blue pot. Okay. The AG letter relates to the pink, pink pot, pot right. at the bottom of the page. And... Um, you're interested in the blue pot. We're interested in the blue pot. I think I said that yes. at the beginning, that that's the 4.5 million, right. and then you would add the 600,000 yes. uh, available from the, what is it, the orange or green pot? Uh, <laughs> the orange pot. Yes. Ms. Moore, you have your mic up. Is it, so the 36 million in the lease purchase program is the part of the AG's opinion that we already have that we cannot that's not spend, even in the issue. That's we, not. But we can't spend that money. Right. That's so, correct. But That's that correct. is an issue in that it, okay. are they saying that we have to go back to the vote of the legislature for two-thirds to spend money that we have in the fund? We have to go back to the vote of the people, not the legislature. Okay. We even exercised that bond authority yet. Is that just unused authority it, or something? It expired. It's cash sitting there. So technically. The program sunsetted. So well, what we should do... Yeah, you can't have arbitrage, so you've got it either. What we should do is, it's, it's and, and I want Senator, Long, Senator Hancock to hear this part. Technically, what we ought to do with the pink money is drop the pink box and use that money to defease the bonds that, that were from where it came, because we can't touch it anyway, unless we want to go back to the vote of the people. So, right, so we just basically can't do anything? We can't do anything with it. So... Can we just drop that box and work with the treasurer's office to see if we can use that money to defease the existing bond? Because it's really it's misleading to have that pot there because uh, it's not really – is am I, am I off, to Henry? Oh, that's correct. Projects yeah. under this program. That is that correct. Yeah, yeah, because because that money is trapped, basically, uh, based on the AG's opinion, the only thing we could use it for is defeasing the bonds. And there are no projects for which you have checks outstanding against this money. Correct. No outstanding no projects outstanding. in the purchase program. Right. So just sitting there and might as well defease and stop paying interest. That, that would make sense. Okay. Then the next issue is then back to your blue pot, $4.5 and that's the one that we have before the AG's office. And uh, Senator Hancock, if I may, suggest that if a letter comes to you that is not consistent with Ledge Council opinion, would you mind calling in the AG attorney and the Ledge Council uh, attorney to your office so they can translate their opinions into English to you so that you can tell us what happened and what we can't do 
Otherwise, we'll find ourselves in the same situation. And if you want to drag Henry with you. I was going to see if I could drag you with me, too. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be of any help on legalese. I can run numbers with you, but on the, if they say we can't do it, if, if, if the Attorney General is saying we can't do it because of bond restrictions, covenants in the bond, and the Treasurer is saying we need that clearance from AG's my, my hands will be tied. And with all due respect to Ledge Council, I have to go with that authority. But there's nothing to prevent you from having those attorneys in your office, and I'll be happy to supply the gloves, and then they can figure out who is what and who's wrong. I, yes, and I, I, I will do everything I can to follow up on this because I think it's it's a very no doubt. There's a very important issue, <laughs> Senator. Yeah. I don't want yeah. to. Uh, um, and uh, I hope that we will. But the AG's opinion will come to Ms. Silverman, will it not? But they also know that Ms. Silverman will also share that with you as soon as it's made available. That's and right. I think the board will give that direction. Am I seeing board members saying yes? Mm -hmm. Ms. Silverman, would you please provide that to course, Senator as soon as it gets Henry? Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. um, and so, is there anything that you think we should do today, Mr. Chairman, in terms of assuming that since the AG has not opined on the um, the blue pot <laughs> well, at all, and we've now taken the opinions that it has made off the table, um, and we have the ledge council opinion that we can use the blue pot. Um, yeah, but the treasurer right. will transfer Unless the. Unless there's an AG's opinion. So, so can, can, what if we do this? What if we do this? And and I and I and I hate to be, you know, putting for, acting four steps ahead, but this issue has been before us for ten months now. So, what if we? The chair is willing to entertain a motion that says something like this. We will the vote. The board will will authorize the transfer of the funds from the 4.5 identified uh, from the 1A pot. There's the residual to the joint use program when and if the green light is given by the attorney general to the state treasurer, and the state treasurer takes the appropriate action to transfer the funds. So that if the AG's opinion comes out tomorrow, and the treasurer can be satisfied tomorrow, then the then staff would go through the list and start providing those resources, as to the tune of about five point one million dollars. I'll second your motion. No, you need to make it because I'm. I'll say I'll entertain a motion. <laughs> so, I, I would so move. I'll second. So it's been moved and second, and this is really. Just for folks in the audience, these are really extenuating circumstances. It is not the, the comfort level for this member to entertain a motion that looks into if the sky is blue on Wednesday and the red van goes by in the I don't want to go into those kinds of motions in the future. So please do not use this as a precedent setting. Does anybody have any questions or comments on this issue? Are there any comments from the public on this issue? Hearing none, I'd, yes, Mr. I'd, Hagman. Just kind of open in thing. I'm just, I'm just going to lay off Matt if you don't need my vote on this because I would like to see what the opinions are and then what options we have. I don't have a list. I don't have anything else to say. Yeah, fund it as soon as we go through because it wasn't really agendized as that. So I have not studied that. I feel very uncomfortable making that, you know, following through with that. Especially if it's been an ongoing issue for 10 months. Yeah. I think I'd rather wait until we get a response. Okay, uh, it needs six votes, so the, the motion would fail. If you could give a courtesy vote, assuming that our other members, somebody else had been here, we might have a shot. Okay, it's bad precedent to start, but... I, this uh, whole thing is, just makes me uncomfortable. I, I, I hear what you're saying, sir. I, I, I totally appreciate, but in my conversations with staff, we know that there's... The first one on the list is Oceanside, Ocean? Redondo Beach. Redondo, I know it's down in the ocean someplace. Redondo, to the tune of one and a half million, one five. 
And then the next one is the Alameda boys. The Alameda to the tune of about one and a half also. Two million. Two million. So that's three and a half right there. Who's third online? Do you know? Uh, we actually have a, a note that some of the projects are at their uh, final stages. So you can definitely prioritize some of the projects that we well, have on the list. Again, going back to the original thing, generally if you have six months or, or more between mm -hmm. different issuance, you go through the list to find out there's still priority. You still meet the qualifications. You do all the stuff. And here you're saying, well, there's not much money. It's only four and a half million. So let's just push it out because we can. Is that the policy? No, I, I, don't, I don't want to look at it that way. Um, we have a funding round, and the, and the commitments were made, we should keep. But if they weren't, then you should go through that round again, just like you would in any other program we do, even if it's very small seven. So which two are approved for funding? Ms. Silverman, how many of those are approved for funding? None of these projects have been approved. Because we do not have the funding. Because we don't have the authority to cover the projects. Right. So the, the cash that could be used could create authority for these projects. Um, what the board has exercised in the past is create the authority, plus they also created a mechanism to give these projects cash immediately. Or they could create the authority and let them compete like everybody else and then give the cash to the next projects on the unfunded list. Again, this is a kind of a so really my next tricky situation. If, if the AG said, yes, you can transfer the money, what has to happen to actually affect that transfer? Will you have to wait for the next bond sale? Is the money there? Because this has its remaining bond authority. Um, does that, is that um, the is money been sold? I mean, what, where are we with, with that? The cash is in the program. The cash <coughs> is sitting there. Okay. Okay. I, I would be happy to, I don't know if I'm, this is on or not, be happy to do a special SAB board meeting if we got the thing this week and say three days notice in public is go, but this is the mechanism. But I'm just saying this is old projects. I understand what's going on with your project. I definitely do. But how is that fair to people when you said it was gone and all of a sudden, well, we have a couple that we would like to get out at the last second like that. Can I just ask a clarifying question that might help with that? The list that you have of joint use projects, they're date order, correct? That's correct. So if we were to establish authority and uh, appropriation at the same time, that list wouldn't change at all, correct? We would just go down the list. That's correct. So there, there is an established list. But is that the normal process for all the rest of the bond fees? Usually you do a funding round, and then you start over. You do a funding round, and you start over. This is basically creating a funding round, but taking the old list that we had from a while ago and saying we're taking that same priority and putting <coughs> it in a funding round. Hence, it's only $4.5 million. Not going to get very far, but it's still that's you're completely diverting from the path that you've been normally taking. I'm just wondering, do you want to set that precedent going forward? Your point's well taken. I think the exception or the only reason why I'm willing to go outside of the norm that normal process is that this issue has been pending since July of last year. Had this issue had not been pending since July, and the AG had made the uh, I'm assuming the AG says go move forward. If the AGC says don't move forward, then the next item I'm going to suggest is that we take this money and do the same thing that we're doing with the pink slip, the pink stuff, and say and find out whether or not we have anything against this money and defeat whatever's left over. No sense on paying interest on on cash sitting there. But just to like clarify, we've been asking the AG opinion we've been since trying July, to this issue since last July. Year. We've been working actively to resolve this issue since July. Yeah. And we've asked the Attorney General for a meeting since July? We've yeah, asked the Attorney General. Informal conversations and conversations with the Treasurer's Office to try to get this resolved. And then we've elevated to request for a written opinion because we were. How long, just out of curiosity, how long we've we been waiting for that opinion uh, since we, we had, did a written request? We had November was a legal written request in November. But like I said, dialogue has been going on for four months prior to that. And then we also changed the flavor of the legal opinion just for, for, uh, for clarifying and for fairness. That's well, correct. Well, Senator. I'll, I'll give you that courtesy motion. I would like to request that maybe we move this to the joint um, audit committee and find out what's going on through general and why it takes them five or six months to come back to opinion letter. That would be a different body than this. So. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to spend a lot of money on, on an audit. So, um, so the question is, do we, have a, do we have authority? And um, if we don't have authority for joint use, could we have authority to spend it on other projects? And if not, I agree with you, then we shouldn't be paying interest on no. it. We should defuse the bonds. 
So assuming we don't have any checks against it, which I don't because I was we would be making this money available. So second, call the roll. Before I vote, I just want to make sure people understand this is not a precedent setting. <laughs> this is very, very unique circumstances here. I. Thank you. Ms. Silverman, Thank you. where we go next? Now we go to the workflow list, tab 11, that's page 92. And if there's okay. no questions next. on that, then uh, meeting's adjourned, I guess. No, any public comments? Public comments on anything we've discussed? Sorry, I've sort of got, I just want to go on the record. I want to thank LA Unified for working with us behind the scenes to take one of the appeal items off the table. So thank you, Eric. Mr. Chair, Mr. I do have one thing maybe to agendize for the future. As we're running out of money here, one of the things I've been working on in the legislature is, I would call it modernization, but technology improvements for schools. And I don't want to spend 30-year dollars or 30-year bond money on five-year-old technology. It only lasts. But is there a mechanism as we look toward 2014 or beyond, can we get something, maybe short-term bonds or something like that for because we have to be digital by 2014. We're supposed to be taking tests by 2014. I want all these in our little kids' hands by 2014. So what can we do or should we do anything as a state allocations board to foster that? So I don't know if there's any information or not, but maybe open for discussion in the future. We'd love to have it. Thank you. Ms. Buchanan? I, I have two comments. One is I, as a result of a couple issues that have come up, I've uh, had a met with staff ask ask a, asking them some audit questions, and I don't know if there's room to add anyone to the yes, audit. Yes, in fact, that's, uh, that's a good yeah. point. Thank I'd you. Love to, if, if it's okay, I'd love to join love that Love to have committee. you join that committee. And Thank then, you. And then secondly, you know, as, as we move forward um, over the next two years, um, we, we talked about keeping a, you know, basically date stamp and keeping a list of projects that are coming in, but clearly, you know, school districts are need some greater assurance, and at the same time, um, all of us have talked at different times about changes to the program we'd like to see. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm at, so Senator Hagman has talked about should we give the same grants for portables as we do for permanent construction. I have a long list that I could go through and I'm not going to bore you now, but I would just like to throw it out as to maybe some of us could come workshop. up with our own list, and whether we have a workshop and then a committee or whatever, but I, I do think there are, are, are things we need to discuss mm -hmm. and probably now is the time to do that. Uh, 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 someone began, that's, a, that's a very good point, and I would like to have that conversation as the large group. The issue becomes of us having to meet outside of the norm to accomplish that, because we sit here and we go through the appeal, the action item, the consent, and, and, this, and this and that, and it, two hours go by relatively quick. I mean, we did start shortly after four, but it's almost six, and we really did not have any other than the Department of Education presentation and back and forth, but we really seem to run out of time very quickly. Well, we have, I mean, we have the month of July coming up, and I don't know how everyone's schedule is, but if we each give up half a day or a day, by that time the budget will have been passed. <laughs> and Just suggest a nice could, place to meet. Yeah, like. <laughs> have a workshop on what they are and, you know, have, have our own laundry list, but maybe, you know, discuss some of these. Is, uh, zero, is that an amiable, Senator Hancock? I mean, is Ms. Moore saying yes? Yes. Uh, yes? It, it said, would be amenable. I actually think I'm not going to be here very many days during July. Okay. I don't know if anyone else is in that situation, but if, if, <laughs> if you guys, um, I, think it's, I think the idea is excellent that we don't want to move ahead without really looking at how far we've come and how we might want to reconfigure or what we might want to do the same or differently. What the need is, even. Um, 
I've said a couple of times too that we have a policy report um, coming from the UC Center for Cities and Schools that could probably be a part of that discussion as well. So we, we uh, staff, if you can try to see, we can look into the calendar, if you, people's calendar, and find some time. I mean, the alternative would be to take a board meeting and do nothing but that. Recognize that we're not going to take any, any issues, but have the board meeting just as a workshop and you know, just plow, have the conversation. I think there's a lot of stuff out there that we need to talk about in terms of you know, giving implementation committee some work to go and, and flush some things through. Too. And if okay. we're running out of money, what Less, else are we going to yeah. do? Yeah, <laughs> so, okay. So let's let's talk staff and see if we can come up with something in July. But if not, then perhaps instead of having a, a full board meeting like this, we have a meeting where we can just have a conversation and not take any other item action items. That's something we can work on for sure. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you, everybody. Much appreciated. Meeting adjourned.